Good morning, everyone, and welcome into this day with Quimper Unitarian Universalist Fellowship. As we begin this service celebrating ministry, I would like to read a very short reflection from this little book, a book of reflections. It's by a retired UU minister, Marilyn Sewell, and it's drawn from her sermons that she presented at First Unitarian Church of Portland. I chose this reflection because it echoes a powerful message of ministry that I personally uh, get consistently and find very meaningful from our own beloved Reverend, Reverend Linda Hart. So these are Marilyn Sewell's words. We will, if we live long enough in this world, have our hearts broken. And do they heal? Not fully, ever. But in the cracked and broken places, that's where the light shines through. My name is Liesl Slaybaugh, and I'm on the board here at QUUF. And as we gather, I acknowledge that the water, lands, and shorelines here in Port Townsend are the traditional territories of the Sklalem and Chemicum peoples. We honor and acknowledge our indigenous members and neighbors, and we vow to help restore and sustain these homelands. If you're visiting today, you have a huge surprise. There's a brunch of palooza in the fellowship hall. <laughs> you may not have expected, but we welcome and invite you to join us for that. I'm sure you saw it as you came in, in the lobby. And there's also a newcomer's table by the patio doors where you can ask questions if you have them. Um, so we're very um, happy to see you here today and we welcome you and thank you for coming. So for some announcements, we have um, first up uh, an announcement about the 2016 QUF Green Sanctuary Eco Hero Award winner, um, a duo, Emma's Revolution. They're going to be here in the sanctuary on April 19th. Pat and Sandy are bringing their Raise Your Voice, Get Out the Vote concert to this sanctuary. So let's come together and push back against voter suppression and inspire engagement in this crucial election year where democracy is on the line. All of our voices are needed to create the country and the world that we want to live in. So bring your friends and family for a wonderful night of music and activism. We have QUUF elections coming up uh, to choose uh, new members for the board, the nominating committee, and the endowment committee. Members will receive their ballots in the, as an email. We're doing email voting this year on April 16th, and you'll all have until April 30th to get your vote made. If you need a paper ballot, please let the office know by April 12th. We will have a candidates forum here in the sanctuary next Sunday, the 14th at 1130. Please come and get to know the candidates who are running for these positions. Our lovely flower arrangement today was donated by Sadi and Rosanna Almeid in um, honor of their 52nd wedding anniversary. Thank you to both of you and well, congratulations. Now, um, is Chris Flutterson in the house anywhere? Chris Flutterson? Oh, oh, here she is. <laughs> Just another relative hanging out, living about. Well, today is the big day, April 7th. I'll admit it. I'm floating on air. <laughs> After the service, we'll have a brunch of Palooza to celebrate the close of this year's stewardship campaign. Hopefully, all the pledge, pledge forms will come swarming in by today's deadline. I'm super excited. Are you? Yes. I actually try to stay calm and unflappable. But when I heard about the pledge increase match challenge, I flapped. We have a rare chance to stretch our pledges this year. I asked my friend, celebrity dachshund Canoodle, to demonstrate how it works. As you can see, all pledge increases will be matched. Thank you, Canoodle. And speaking of pledges, you'll find the pledge table in the fellowship hall. It's the pledge headquarters today. 
Just look for the special blue mailbox that Mark Byrne made for us. People to answer questions, extra pledge forms, and that's also where you enter the raffles. Yes, I said raffles. I asked Reverend Linda what kind of cake she would like to celebrate her 40th year of ministry. She said, carrot cake with cream cheese frosting. <laughs> Laura Byrne has baked a most magnificent carrot cake. We will have a drawing for the original raffle prize and due to popular demand, we will also be having the great cream cheese frosting raffle. The, what does that mean? Well, the Reverend Linda and Peter, the guests of honor, will get two of the corners of the cake. <laughs> They're corner people. But we'll be raffling off the other two corners. <laughs> Can you believe it? I made, I made a brunch of palooza checklist so you won't miss any of the fun. So here are some things to keep in mind. One, make sure you have a name tag. Two, turn in your pledge form at the pledge table if you haven't already turned it in. Three, get out of your cocoon and pose in the photo booth. Four, mix, mingle, and frolic. Whatever frolic means to you. Five, feast. Help yourself to a magnificent brunch buffet, which I'm sure you saw as you came in this morning. Six, enter both raffles, and they're free. Seven, here's a challenge for you. Introduce yourself to at least two people you don't already know. And eight, have a good time. If you are at home now watching online, please pop over and join us after the service if you can. The stewardship team asked me to convey this message. They said they are so grateful for every type of engagement, from the swarm of handcrafted colorful butterflies to brunch offerings and heartfelt testimonials, and they are especially grateful for the financial commitments made to support QUUF. And my message is, with a resourceful, energetic, get things done, heartfelt group like QUF, the sky's the limit. Say it with me, the sky's the limit. Thank you, thank you. Let us settle our minds and calm our hearts. Down the cobblestones, 
cobblestones Looking for fun and feeling groovy Sing along, feeling groovy didn't necessarily expect a sing-along right away, but there you have it, right, y'all? I saw, I saw your mouths moving out there. I know you were singing along. Good morning. Let's see if I can rearrange this a little here. Oh, what a day. What a day. So good to see all of you here today. Our opening words are from my colleague, Katie Romano Griffin. She writes, come let us enter this space of hope and community. Come and let us enter this space with our sorrows, with our joys, with our passions, and our compassion. Come let us enter into this space with the stories of our ancestors for their strength and wisdom beats in our hearts. Come into this space present to the beloved companions who move beside us. Come into this space mindful that together we are building a future of other generations. Come, come into this space and let us worship together. It is good to be with you and to be together this morning. Will you join me in the words for lighting our chalice? Symbol of light and knowledge, symbol of warmth and freedom, we light this chalice as a symbol of our faith. Here we gather to celebrate hope and the infinite possibilities of love. Let's join in singing our first song, which is uh, number 145 in the Gray Hymnal, um, As Tranquil Streams. y'all. It's time for the time for all ages. So anyone who wants to come up? Small, large, young, creaky, like me. Any of us, all of us can come up. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I know. 
going to be really hard to see the book from there, but <laughs> there we go. Yay! So you guys, we're having a party today. Did you notice that when you came in? It's like there's a party going to be going on, right? And part of the party is that we're just getting finished with a, a, you know, a special time in the church where we ask people for their support. But it's also, this is really crazy, 40 years ago, right? That's like a long time ago. I got to become a really long time ago. I cannot believe how long a time ago. That's when I got to be a minister. I got, or it's called ordained in the, the congregation, the church I grew up in. They said to me, Linda, you're a minister, but it was longer than that. It was a big, it was a big ceremony, and there were lots of people there, and all kinds of, everybody was in robes like this. Well, the ministers were. So I wanted to talk just a little bit about one of the things that ministers do is, um, and one of the things that I think is really important in ministry is that we try to remind each other, I try to remind folks, and I'm reminding myself every time I do it, about things that are important in life. And one of the things that um, I try to remind people about and I remind myself about is how important it is just to breathe, right? You know, just to take a minute and take a nice deep breath. Let's do that together, shall we? Can we, so, so just exhale everything. And then nice big breath in. And then sigh it out. Don't you feel better? Anybody feel a little better? Do you? Yeah, yes. Do you have something to say? You just want to say you, you feel that much better. Awesome. So the book today that I want to share with you is called My Magic Breath. And they say it's finding calm through mindful breathing. And so I just want to take a minute or two to do one of my ministerial kinds of things. And I just want to remind us to take a breath sometimes. Here's the book if you're ready to hear. Do you have the magic breath? Oh, we get to do it again. Let's see. Take a deep breath in and blow it out. Can you do it this pretty? Wow, you do have the magic breath. The magic breath is special. It helps you when you have too many thoughts running through your mind. At the end of the day, there's a lot to think about. Right? Do you find that sometimes? Sometimes when you are worried or nervous or sad, deep breaths can help push some of those thoughts away. Think about when you feel happy. Taking a big <coughs> breath in and thinking about something that made you feel great will help you to enjoy your happy moments even more. It's magic. All right, we're going to do it again, gang. Ready? thinking about something happy. What happened today that made you smile? Take a deep breath in and picture that moment in your mind. Maybe it was that yummy breakfast you had. Let's blow all of those happy thoughts back out so other people can have them. Wow. Now that's a lot of happiness. Keep blowing and keep thinking. Whoa, what a lot of happiness. Some of you, I can tell, have a smile on your face. A big smile can help you feel better. Who knows that? Do you all know that? You can help make yourself feel better just by smiling. But sometimes things happen that make you feel sad or mad. I hope, I hope nothing happened to any of you this morning that made you feel sad or mad, but sometimes it happens, and it gets stuck in your mind sometimes. And the magic breath helps there, too. So maybe I got most of it, yeah. He was checking to make sure I got all the words. Um, I, I revised it a little bit. <laughs> Ministers get to do that. Part of the special dispensation we get. So if we think about something... Now, actually, I'm not going to invite you to think about something bad, but I'm going to say, if, if something bad happens, you can do this same thing. We can take a deep breath and blow it out and release some of the sadness. Have you done that? What the book said. You did that what? What the book said. What the book said. You did what the book said. Awesome. I did what that picture said. 
You up there, okay. <clears throat> I love the assistance. Thank you for helping. One more time, we're going to take even a bigger breath and think about that happy thought. So one more time, breathe in. And think about that happy thought. Blow out anything that's bugging you right now. We can try to blow it off the page and then even out of sight. Whew, goodbye sad thoughts. Do you feel better now? You used your magic breath to help out. Taking deep breaths in and out when you are sad or mad or worried can help you, or happy, can help you feel better. Your magic breath can help you laugh and appreciate happy times. Magic breath can also help you feel calm when you're not so happy. Instead of having your mind full of thoughts at the end of your day, your mind is ready for sweet dreams. Let's try a big yawn together. So breathe in and... Oh. Well, we're not going to say sweet dreams good night, but because I'm really trusting y'all are going to stay awake through the service. It, it, can I get an amen, please? Amen. Thank you, dears. All right, friends, let's uh, make an aisle. Uh, Mike, make an aisle along the. Yeah. <clears throat> Let the kids go through. Go now in peace. Go now in peace. May the spirit of love surround you everywhere, everywhere you may go. Go now in peace. Go now in peace. May the spirit of love surround you. have a message for you this morning. Okay. okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. All right. Very good. So did you hear our names? Yeah, yeah you they know, know us. You know us. All right. <laughs> We've been members of QUUF for only a few years since 2018, but our Unitarian journey started over 48 years ago at Second Unitarian Church in Chicago. We moved to Seattle in 1977, where we spent most of our working careers in healthcare. We visited several UU fellowships over that time, and we were members at North Lake Unitarian in Kirkland for some time, where our children were part of the religious education program. Our longtime friends, Carl and Barbara Allen and Bob and Kathy Francis, moved to Port Townsend years ago. And whenever we visited them, we also visited QUUF. We always enjoyed Bruce Bodie's services and found the fellowship warm and inviting. It was natural for us to become members when we moved here full time in 2018. What we found here at QUUF is what we call our extended family of choice, where we have made many friends and still have many more people to get to know much better. We've also learned a lot um, from um, being at QUUF, and we've reflected on the sermons, the poetry, the Alps classes, the community events, and even some of the difficult discussions. We've spent time helping with auctions, book sales, rummage sales, and many other activities. I think you all know the list. Along the way, we've engaged with various committee activities, and Dean has served on several committees and as a general assembly delegate. During the pandemic, we joined our covenant group 
which continued to meet weekly um, on Zoom. It really kept us connected to QUUF and our, friend, and our covenant group members became our good friends. During the pandemic, uh, this really um, helped us cope with the isolation of, of the situation that we had, all being uh, staying at home all the time. All of these activities have been great growth experiences and also very soul satisfying experiences for us. We continue to learn a lot about ourselves and how much we value our new and ongoing relationships with Quimper Unitarian Universalist Fellowship. We realized early then, in addition to our participation in QUUF life, uh, such an organization also relies on our financial support. Pledging each year was a natural commitment for us to make. And as we were able to increase our financial commitment to support the mission, the values and the principles that guide us all, and to support this place that enriches our lives so much. As we approach the coming church year, we hope that you will join us in this stewardship journey with your pledge. We are so thankful for the great ministry of Reverend Linda, the awesome family ministry for our children under Bo's leadership, the recreation of the adult learning program, and the tremendous energy that we've seen from many of you and that helps our fellowship thrive. This is truly an exciting time for us, so we hope you will join us on this with your stewardship pledge if you haven't done already. Thanks for listening. Thank you. We pause now for a time of generosity and to receive an offering to support the life and ministry of QEUF and the food bank. The ushers will come among you to receive the offering and additional ways for giving will be projected. Please join me in our offering words. This fellowship of ourselves, its energy and resources are our energy and resources. Its wealth is what we share. As we contribute to the life of this community, we affirm our lives within it.
Each week we set aside time for the sharing of joys and sorrows. Uh, we recognize when we do this that our own personal joys and sorrows are only a fragment of the larger community of life. And so we place a stone, our first stone, remembering that this day marks six months of the conflict between Hamas and Israel, six months of the ongoing chaos in Gaza. Within the congregation, um, I am likely to get the surname wrong, but um, bear with me. Ida Domaslicki, did I get that? Did I get close? Do you all know close? Okay, close, good. She asks for a candle uh, to be lit to celebrate the extraordinary life of Bruce's mother, Beverly, who died this week, just three weeks after her 100th and second birthday. One of 11 siblings, she grew up on an Iowa farm, was a teacher, and during World War II was a ship welder. After the death of her husband, she lived alone until very recently and was a voracious reader to the end. A light has gone out. Henry Amick asks for a candle to be lit for those who have the courage to stop eating and drinking, for those who choose a death with dignity by whatever means they have at hand when life has become no longer livable. And we place a final stone holding in our hearts these uh, joys and sorrows that I have shared, but also recognizing those joys and sorrows that are unexpressed but of no less importance. Thank you. Let's come into a few moments of quiet and reflection together. It's the time to use that magic breath maybe a little bit. To take a few breaths in and out. These words. Spirit of love and life, we are blessed. May we be blessed this day. Blessed with eyes to see and ears to hear blessed by discerning that of the mystery of the holy that surrounds us always. In the freshness of this spring, the bulbs pressing into view, the small tender buds on vines and trees. In the beauty of scent and the sweetness of love given um, given to us by the beloveds who grace our lives. May we also see the holy there in our moments of pain and loss, in grief and fear. In those times, find that holy, the mystery that abides with us always. Help us, O Spirit of life, to embrace our daily round of hours and moments and all that comes. And may we find that you are always there. Let us pause for a few moments, a few moments of stillness. So may it be. Amen. Anniversary of my ordination, the first from President of the UUA, uh, the Reverend Dr. Sophia Betancourt, and also from my colleague in the United Kingdom. Um, uh, the Reverend Aunt Howe, who, um, for those of you who know our ministerial system here in the U United States, 
um, ministers before they become officially Unitarian Universalist ministers go see a, a, a group called the uh, Fellowship Committee. In the United Kingdom, um, the Fellowship Committee, which Aunt refer my friend Aunt references, um, is the uh, equivalent of our U uh, UU Ministers Association. So don't be perplexed by, um, by that when he speaks. Gary, please, can we see these? I'm going to go sit. Hi, everybody. I'm Reverend Ant Howe, and I serve on the Ministerial Fellowship Committee here in the UK with the Unitarians. And it's an honour to bring greetings from Linda's UK colleagues on this occasion of 40 years of Linda's ministry. Here in the UK, we were blessed to have Linda with us when she served one of our London churches for a number of years. She became a valued colleague and she benefited our ministerial gatherings by serving on our fellowship committee and helping to organise some of our memorable conferences. We were very sad when she returned to the US, although she's continued to show support for her ministerial colleagues over here in the UK. I am very blessed to be able to call Linda a very dear friend. Linda, I've always admired you as a minister, a preacher, a storyteller, a joke teller and a pastor. But our friendship is one that I treasure. Linda, huge congratulations on this milestone in your ministerial journey. Thank you for all you've done to nurture our precious faith and every blessing on the years of ministry still to come. Beloveds at Quimper UU Fellowship, I am so excited, and if I'm honest, a little bit in awe, to be joining you today to celebrate your minister's 40th ordination anniversary. The Reverend Linda Hart, as you know, takes care of congregations, a dozen of them at least, including one in the UK, and also serves as what we call a colleague's colleague, not only serving in developmental and interim and settled UU ministries, but being called on regularly to support other ministers in times of trouble, in times of congregational need, in times when we sometimes just need someone to listen, to work with us, and to help us engage. Reverend Linda, you have served as a good officer for many, many years, and for this and for your exemplary four decades of service, you have my gratitude, my thanks, my celebration. I wish you all joy on this day, and I hope that you know, I hope that your people remind you often of what a gift your blessings are to this world. Thank you for your ministry. Thank you for your steadfastness. Thank you for 40 years. Thank you, beloved. While you watch the slides, I'm going to share with you a song I wrote about seasons of the year when I was 16 years old. song again and the wind new flowers sing along they say hey what a beautiful day to unfurl to a world that was once cold and grain I've seen the wonders of the seasons unfold I've seen a daffodil sing her anthem to spring in gold, in gold. Bumblebee flies free through the lazy hours with all his heart he takes part. 
in the yard of the flowers. The robins are bobbing in the cool of the shade by the squirm of a worm. Breakfast is made. I've seen the wonders of the seasons unfold. Warm summer days soon appear, bringing warm sun rays so near. As they have through the years since time untold. Now the wind is the friend of the earthly pleasure. Fall is the recall of all the green treasure. The people rake and sigh, wondering why. The seasons have no reasons, they come to just die. I've seen the wonders of the seasons unfold. I've seen a daffodil sing its anthem to spring in gold. Now the winter is the center of attraction and worry. Snow and ice isn't nice, it bites, makes people scurry. To hide inside by the warmth of the fire, their woe is the snow, they freeze and quickly tire. I've seen the wonders of the seasons unfold. Icicles cast colored light, snowflakes dance in delight, to a world enveloped in white and cold, and cold. Spring sings a happy song again in the wind, new flowers sing along. They say, hey, it's a beautiful day to unfurl to a world once so cold and gray. I've seen the wonders of the seasons unfold. I've seen a daffodil sing her anthem to spring in gold. In gold, in gold. We have a couple of readings today. To share. The first is from uh, an essay by Adam Gopnik that was in the New, York, New Yorker magazine um, a long time ago. I'm, I can't even remember <clears throat> how long I've been carrying it around. And I have used it um, on the occasion of ordinations of colleagues of mine. Um, in this essay, um, uh, Gopnik talks about his friend Kurt Varndow, um, who and offers um, in talking about him offers an insight into the nature of ministry. Um, Varndo, an art historian, was dying from uh, cancer when he agreed to coach a team of eight-year-old football players. He had a background in football, having played many years before, and he took on the role with a lot of enthusiasm. Gopnik, whose son was on the team, watched the practices with suspicion at first, uh, the kids, uh, if you've been around this before, the kids just ran around on the field kind of randomly for a while. Um, and then Kurt began building um, with small building blocks, breaking down the plays into small eight-year-old manageable bits. Um, they learned the plays, astonishingly enough, and completed them. When Gopnik reflected on his friend's ability to bring the kids uh, along, he said, uh, this is what he wrote about that. It is said sometimes that the great teachers and mentors, the rabbis and gurus, 
achieve their ends by inducting the disciple into a kind of secret circle of knowledge and belief, make of their charisma a kind of gift. The more I think about it, though, the more I suspect that the best teachers, and for that matter, the truly long-term winning coaches, do something else. They don't mystify the work and offer themselves as a kind of rabbinical authority, a practice that al almost always lapses into a history of acolytes and excommunications. The real teachers and coaches may offer a charismatic model. They probably have to. But then they insist that all the magic they have is to offer a commitment to repetition and perseverance. The great oracles may enthrall, but the really great teachers demystify. They can make particle physics into a series of diagrams that anyone can follow, football into a series of steps that anyone can master, and art into a series of slides that anyone can see. A guru gives himself and then his system. A teacher gives us her subject and then ourselves. It has been my goal in ministry to do that. The Religion of Tomorrow by Bob Carnan. If a measure of spiritual honesty exists, and if we are to have it in our future, it is to be found now in the individual heart, taken in great variety and in every condition. It is to be found in our wisdom, our compassion, our forgiveness, and our loyalty to love, even to the gates of hell and it is to be found in our wretched depression, vile envies, heated conflicts, long days of labor, in our failures, our stupidity, and our empty longing. It is in our competence and our lack of it, our learning and our foolishness. It is all of these, and in the, last, in the loss of a substantial naivete and the loss of sacred truths, and the transformation of our lives wrought by the living of our days done well and done sometimes not so well. Such is the nature of spiritual empowerment if we will set it free. Ministry means at least to live in and amidst and vulnerable to the struggle of each and every one of us as we seek to come to an understanding of who we are, where we are, how we are. And ministry means much, sort, much more so to help us to raise up the vision of where it is we must go as a people and invite us, if we need the invitation, to join hands and hearts to get there. Let us not fail miserably by holding up a dose of religion when it is the sacred living presence that we seek. Excellent religion is always revolutionary, transformative, a pointing in human terms towards greater than human realities. The religion of tomorrow is to be found not in our great analyses and pungent minds and fevered millennial learning. It is also to be found in our hearts now as we live with love and courage in the ever-present world, which also gives us emptiness and despair. I want to introduce you to our speaker today. Ellen Johnson Fay is coming to us via video that we taped earlier this week. Ellen lives in Colorado Springs, and um, I had hoped we would be able to bring her up here, but her travel schedule prior to this didn't allow for it. So she's joining us online today with uh, others of you who may be out there. Um, 
I think Ellen will probably note as well that she was the religious educator at the church I grew up in. And um, not during most of my time there, I think I was a teen by the time she started working there. And four years before my ordination, that congregation ordained her to the Ministry of Religious Education. And she has continued on in ministry um, since that time. Um, when she and I were talking this week, I can't remember why I specifically asked Ellen to preach that Sunday. I think probably because she was part of my known world and part of the ministers that I knew and people I respected and wanted to invite to be part of my ordination. Um, and so um, I um, offer you this opportunity to hear from her um, today as she offers our sermon. And I'm going to come down and enjoy it with you. You honored me 40 years ago by inviting me to take part in your ordination, along with some truly stellar Unitarian Universalist leaders, both clergy and lay. And I feel honored again today, along with some truly stellar Unitarian Universalists, now called to celebrate 40 remarkable years in ministry. That day, our opening song, if you remember, was Here We Are. And if you don't mind, you could join me. <laughs> Here we are, all together as we sing this song joyfully. Here we are, all together as we hope we may always be. Gather now as friends to celebrate this great and glorious day, all as one. Here we are, all together as we hope we may always be. That was a big risk. Uh, I still can sing a little bit. Well, 40 years later, we're gathered with new friends, even as we hold in memory those that have passed from this earth but remain with us in spirit. I noted that day that we were celebrating one of our own children. I had known you as a teen, but many had known you as a little girl. And I don't think any of us imagined that you, kind of a wild spirit at that time, would grow into young womanhood and you would be calling upon us as your church to ordain you into the Unitarian Universalist Ministry. What a great and glorious day for us that day, and this day to celebrate those 40 wondrous years. I also noted, and it's all the more true today, it's a day on which we are sensitive to the world's pain and to the pain that may be with any of us. That day, I was returning to the church I began serving as Director of Religious Education, the Unitarian Church of Rockville, Maryland. It was 1970 when I first started there. And by the time I arrived, you were a teenager. As I mentioned, I didn't get to know you nearly as well as I knew your remarkable mother, Mary. And I hope many of you have seen the picture, and maybe you have it somewhere else, uh, Linda, of you looking at your mother seated in, I think it was a wheelchair, at your ordination with such love and that unique smile that you have <laughs> with these two dimples or what is it about the way your uh, mouth curls up at the edges, which is just you. Well, our paths have intersected in unique ways over the years, and it's uh, relevant to begin with our paths to ordination, which we both um, would call irregular. Um, for you, the irregularity was that you had not yet finished all the requirements of the Department of Ministry of the Unitarian Universalist Association. You hadn't yet graduated from theological school. And I too had been ordained, as I said, by that congregation four years earlier, also a somewhat irregular fellowship process, which I don't need to get into. 
The haste for you had to do with the illness of your mother. When Ken McLean pulled you aside and encouraged you to plan a su an ordination soon. Ken was the minister of nearby Cedar Lane Church, where I was now the minister of religious education. With Linda's permission, I have a family memory to share that was news to Linda when we spoke the first time about this celebration. Her mother, Mary, was quite influential in the Unitarian Universalist Association. She was rich with wisdom and strong opinions and not shy to give advice. Shortly after I was ordained, the position of Minister of Religious Education opened at Cedar Lane, and it seemed appropriate for me to apply for that position now that I was a minister and probably not as suited to Rockville as I had always been. Mary, with the best of intentions, sagely advised me not to apply that it was not the right congregation for me. I should stay at Rockville, which was really sweet because it was a love relationship as I uh, trust it was for Linda in a, in a way. So this was one time I didn't follow her advice and it turned out to be a good move. And that's most of all because I did get to work with Ken, a very wise, um, and highly regarded minister of his day, and his ministry continues until today. He is age 97. He's less active, but no less wise, caring, and beloved for those who know him. And I've been lucky enough to keep in touch with him all these years. So I will be sure to tell him about the celebration, unless he already knows from the UUA grapevine. It could be. I actually had found, which is why I have some fairly clear memories of that celebration, that I had kept a copy of my decades old words and it is now um, yellowed and it's typewritten and there are all kinds of deletions as we did in those days um, before computers came into such uh, use by everybody. And I had the message that I delivered that morning, I was surprised to see how relevant it still is today. I was a little uh, puzzled by the title I chose, Growing Pains, Growing Joy, until I remember the unusual circumstance that your mother was near death from her diagnosis of colon cancer. You were about to experience the inevitable though far too soon, death of your mother, and to learn from that experience and many other difficult experiences over the decades. The lessons offered by pain, you learn all too well. And you also learned the possibility of transformation of pain into a joy that might not other be realized. I used a reading then, familiar to many, maybe even now, um, Khalil Gibran wrote it, and it was from his book, The Prophet, and it was the reading on joy and sorrow. And so I'm going to read it today. I don't agree with all of it at, at the end, which I'll just mention briefly. When a woman said, speak to us of joy and sorrow, the prophet answered, your joy is your sorrow unmasked, and the self-same well from which your laughter rises was oftentimes filled with your tears. How else can it be? The deeper that sorrow carves into your being, the more your joy can contain, the more you, more joy you can contain. When you are joyous, look deeply into your heart, and you shall find it is only that which has given you sorrow that is now giving you joy. When you are sorrowful, look again in your heart and see that in truth you are weeping for that which has been your delight. Some of you say joy is greater than sorrow. Some say sorrow is greater, is the greater. But I say unto you, they are inseparable. Together they come. 
When one sits alone with you at your board, remember that the other is asleep in your bed. Verily, you are suspended like scales between your sorrow and joy. Only when you are empty are you at a standstill and balanced. So I'm going to ask all of you, think now your own thoughts of joy and sorrow. Are you one that would say that joy is greater or that sorrow is the greater? Do you think they are inseparable? Well, that day, 40 years ago, I made the case for joy being the greater, and I still do. And I get that notion. Um, I understand that suffering is an inescapable human condition. And there are lots of spiritual and psychological folks who will have shared their wisdom over the ages about joy and sorrow and so forth. But it's Thich Nhat Hanh's interpretation that called to me, oh, uh, just about 40 years ago when I first encountered his teaching, and his interpretation of the Four Noble Truths of Buddhism, and some of you may be familiar with them. So the first noble truth is there is suffering. Thich Nhat Hanh liked to translate that as ill-being. And the second noble truth is that there is a cause of ill-being. And he named those causes um, as uh, craving, attachment, um, greed, and so forth. And also aversion or hatred. Those are the causes. If we hold them in us, we will suffer and we make other people suffer. So there's a cause and that's good news because if there's a cause and we are aware of it, we can transform that. And there, so the fourth noble truth is there is an end to suffering. Uh, there is well-being. He does, oh, wait, let me just say further, that end is the Eightfold Path. And so some of you might be familiar with it. It's about right view, right thinking, right action, right livelihood, right mindfulness, and so on. And then there's endless teachings on how to live in that way so that when suffering comes, you are able to be mindful, aware, hold it with compassion and transform it in yourselves and therefore in others. And um, Linda, I, for me, you are an exemplar of that. You have suffered and you have transformed suffering and you are a source of such joy and hope and for all the people that you have served and touched with your life. And there's a testimony to that on the, on the website. I'm going to quote one of your colleagues. Um, and the, but before I do that, I want to share um, a little bit of that reading that you shared with me. You chose another reading for the service, which was very meaningful. But I really appreciated what Bob Carnan, the late reverend, um, said um, in his essay, The Religion of Tomorrow. And I'm just going to lift up a little piece of it um, because it repeats what I have just shared from Thich Nhat Hanh. Ministry, he wrote, means at least to live in and amidst and vulnerable to the struggle of each and every one of us as we seek to come to an understanding of who we are where we are, how we are. And ministry means more so to help us to raise up the vision of where it is we must go as a people and invite us, if we need the invitation, to join hands and hearts to get there. It's the sacred living presence we seek. Excellent religion is always revolutionary, transformative, a pointing in human terms toward greater than human realities. The religion of tomorrow is to be found 
not in our great analyses and pungent minds and fevered millennial learning. It's to be found in our hearts. Now, as we live with love and courage in the ever-present world that also gives us emptiness and despair. I'll repeat, you are an exemplary practitioner, Linda, of this vision and also of the guru, Adam Gopnik, which is the reading uh, you shared. It has been my privilege to be first a mentor to you. And now, as you have grown in pain and joy, be mentored by you. One of your colleagues, Sarah LaWall, had posted on your Facebook page, and I hope she's here at your celebration if she's able to be. Linda, you are one of our senior colleagues that keeps learning, growing, teaching, and most of all, supporting newer ministers and everyone really, she said, and it's like me, I'm an elder minister um, who is benefited so much from your invitation. You honored me so deeply um, to be worthy of giving you um, my words on this occasion. And uh, your commitment to this vocation is so admirable. Thank you. And I bet she speaks for everyone gathered for your celebration. May you be blessed in the next steps of your remarkable journey as you bless so many others. May it be so. I, I, I think the most remarkable thing that uh, Ellen said in there is... Uh, is that she still has the paper copy, <laughs> right, of the sermon she delivered 40 years ago. I mean, come on, y'all. I, I, yeah, I've lost more things than I can even recount. I'm going to take a few more minutes, friends, to offer a couple of reflections um, to you um, on this occasion. Um, I am... I have to tell you, just humbled and grateful uh, to have had the gift of serving in ministry for 40 years. All of my classmates, when I entered me the Lombard Theological School um, in the fall of 1980, were pursuing their second or third careers and now have been long retired um, from their ministries. Back in that day, many of them spoke um, with a tinge of envy saying, oh, you're so lucky to have found ministry this early in your life. I never said, but always thought, yeah, but what if it's my first career, <laughs> right? All these years later, it turns out they were right. Unitarian Universalist ministry has taken me places that I never could have expected. First to the night ministry on the north side of Chicago where I helped create the open door a shelter for homeless youth, which all these 30-some years later is still functioning there. From there, I fell in love with a little congregation in a small village in Vermont, um, and uh, then offered interim support to a congregation in Danbury, Connecticut, and then went on to a large congregation in Spokane. From there, a brief, uh, what I called my maternity sabbatical, um, blended into two part-time ministries with small congregations, the Near Valley Congregation in South Seattle, and later a fellowship in Lacey. When an opportunity opened for um, me to take my ministry to England, I jumped at the chance and discovered the delight of the Richmond and Putney Unitarians in Southwest London and the General Assembly of Unitarian and Free Christian Churches, a paragraph rather than a title, the UK equivalent of our Unitarian Universalist Association. When I came back to the US, I went, uh, did an interim with the Evergreen UU Fellowship in Marysville, and as they called their next minister, I took up a developmental and then settled ministry 
in, with the Tacoma UU congregations there for nine years. I couldn't have expected to arrive here at Quimper UU Fellowship when I began thinking about a move, but the world turns in unexpected ways um, sometimes, and so here I am, still going, maybe not the Energizer Bunny any longer, um, but I do seem to keep going. And what I know is that none of it would have been possible without the guidance and companionship of, of mentors, colleagues, and friends who have been there steadfastly for me through the decades. For over 26 years, the love and support and care given to me by my beloved husband, Peter, has made possible the work I do. And crucially, I couldn't be here all these years later without the dedicated and loving people of the congregations whose commitment to this faith, whose hard work and ongoing love supports, enables, and enhances the ministry that in the end belongs to them. That is, belongs to you all. Sending a card, showing up for each other, speaking directly to each other in times of conflict, serving on a committee, taking a casserole to someone who needs it, showing up for worship together, and so much more. That's the ministry. That's what you all make possible day on day on day. I couldn't do it without you and all your work. There is more ministry for us to do together, my friends, and I eagerly anticipate what comes next. So may it be. Speaking of what comes next, where are we? We are, um, <clears throat> we are going to sing our closing hymn, which is Wo Ya Ya, number uh, 1020, if you're um, following along. And let me just note, um, Wo Ya Ya is perhaps my favorite hymn, and in some measure it is because I always feel this way, um, or feel this way quite a lot. Um, we are going, heaven knows where we are going, but we know we are. And so I invite you to sing along with me this uh, song. Um, Wo ya ya. Let's hit it. We are going, heaven knows where we are going, but we know within, and we will get there, heaven knows how we will get there, but we know we will, it will be hard, we know, and the road will be muddy and rough, but we'll get there. Heaven knows how we will get there, but we know we will. Wo ya ya, wo ya ya, wo ya ya, wo ya ya, we are going. Heaven knows where we are going, but we know within. And we will get there, heaven knows how we will get there, but we know we will. Oh ya, wo ya ya, wo ya ya, wo ya ya. Wo ya ya, wo ya ya, wo ya ya, wo ya 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 ya. World, as speaking well of what we value, honesty, love, forgiveness, trust, 
of speaking well of our efforts, of speaking well of our dreams. This is how we celebrate life, through speaking well of it, living the benediction, and becoming a word well spoken. Amen and blessed be. I believe something. Oh, we have to extinguish. I do this, right? You know, it wouldn't have, wouldn't have been my service if I hadn't forgotten something, right? Let's extinguish our flame. We extinguish our flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, the fire of commitment, or the power of transformation. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. I, be I believe something's going to happen.
Thank you.